uh, open your copy of Scripture tonight to Psalm 119, where we've been for several weeks of time now. I think we've come to uh, message number 13 in Psalm 119, this longest chapter in all the Bible, longest psalm. Psalm 119 has 178 verses, 22 stanzas, 176 verses rather. So tonight we're going to look at the next group of eight verses. And so we're going to be in verses 97 through 104 tonight. That corresponds to the Hebrew letter Mam. And so Psalm 119, we're going to begin at verse 97 in just a moment. Do you guys remember Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy and all those? You might be a redneck if jokes. I, lo- I could listen to him tell those jokes for a couple of hours. They're hilarious. A little sampling of some I reminded myself online. If you mow your yard and find three old cars, you might be a redneck, right? If you've ever made change in the offering plate, and I have, (laughs) you might be a redneck. If you've been in church long enough, you probably did somewhere along the way. If you have a complete set of salad bowls that all say Cool Whip on the side, you might be, you know y'all got that in your home, right up in your cabinets. If you live in a home with wheels, but you own several cars without wheels, you might be a redneck. If you think sweet tea is the official beverage of the United States of America, you might be, I mean, we could go on for hours in that vein. I love those jokes. But what if somebody reinvented that to say this, you know you love the Scripture if, what would that be like? What would be said? What would that look like? Well, that's kind of what this part of Psalm 119 is all about. You'll see why when I start reading verse 97 here in just a moment. So if you're there, say amen. Amen. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, Lord, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. So tonight I want to kind of answer that question for you. Uh, You know you love Scripture if. Number one tonight, you know you love the Scripture if you meditate on the truth. You know you love the Word of God if you meditate on the truth. Verse 97, what does he say there? Oh, how I love your law. I love it. I love the Scripture. Now, he's talking about the Torah there, first five books of the Bible, but the Old Testament included. This was a question on Jeopardy last night, by the way. I guess this is germane to what we were talking about last night. I don't watch Jeopardy very often, but I was having dinner last night, and my kids had it on in the next room. And it's college, if I'm correct, it's college Jeopardy week. They had these kids up there. Well, one of the categories last night was the Bible, Bible books. They know about physics. They know about technology. They know about pop culture. You ask them a question about the Bible, it's like crickets. They said in the Old Testament, there are three parts of the Old Testament, and there there is the prophets and the writings, and there is one other book. There's one other part for the Jewish people. They asked them, it was crickets in the room. I was saying, Torah, Torah, that's the law. Remember in the, in the, at the end of Jesus said at the end of the, of the Gospel of Luke, He talked about the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's the Old Testament. That's the Word of God. That's the Word of God that David had available to him, that the psalmist had available to him. So he says, Lord, I love your Word. I love your law. And then he says, it's my meditation all the day. In other words, when I read the Scripture, I put it on my mind, I put it in my heart, and then throughout my day. As I'm living, as I'm going throughout the day, whether I'm working or whether I'm eating or whether I'm traveling or playing or whatever I'm doing, the Word of God's on my heart and on my mind. 
How, how do you get like that? How do you get to the place where you meditate on the truth of Scripture throughout the day? Don't you think the best way to do that is to begin the day with Scripture? To start it that way. I don't know where your Bible reading maybe was this morning or this afternoon or whenever you do your devotional time this morning. Mine was in Matthew chapter 4. Where the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 that after Jesus was baptized, you know the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 that Jesus was led, you probably thought it said was led by the devil into the wilderness. The Bible says Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Where for 40 days and 40 nights he fasted because being the omniscient Lord that he is, he knew what awaited him in 40 days. And what awaited him was temptation at the hands of the devil. And the devil came to Christ to tempt him, to tempt his body, hunger, to tempt his mind, and to tempt his soul. Bow down to me and all the kingdoms of the world will be yours. And in one of the places he took him to the temple, he said, throw yourself down. He said, because it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. See, that's how crafty the devil is. He takes the word of God and twists the word of God to try and tempt you because he perverts things. What I'm saying to you is the only way that we can overcome that is to be in the Word of God and then throughout the day to meditate on the Word. I'll ask you this and then I'll move on to the next point. When you're, as you're going throughout your day, working, cleaning, whatever it may be that you are, find yourself doing, what do, you, what do you find yourself thinking about? What, when you don't have anything else to think about, when you're just doing your work or whatever you're doing, what do you think about? A, a large part of our thinking ought to be to meditate on the truth of the Word of God. And by the way, if we would get more of the Word of God inside of us, there would be less and less of this other stuff coming out of us. Amen? Number two. I said, first of all, you know you love the Scripture if you meditate on the truth. Number two, you know you love the Scripture if you grow wiser over time. If you grow wiser, I didn't say smarter, if you grow wiser over time, verses 98 through 100, Psalmist says there, you, Lord, through your commandments, you make me wiser. Now, I want to help you understand something from the beginning. It's one thing to be smart. There's a lot of atheists that are brilliant. In fact, sometimes I've heard it said before, and we know this can be misinterpreted, but we're certainly not anti-education. I'm certainly not anti-education. I've got a couple degrees hanging on the wall. But you can be so smart, you can be so indoctrinated in the ways of the world that you no longer want to consider the claims of God. It's one thing to be smart. You can be very academic, but just because a person is smart does not mean that he or she is wise. But when you read the Word of God, you gain wisdom over the course of time. When you love the Scripture, you get wiser over time. Look what he says there. He says, Lord, you make me wiser than my enemies. For they are ever with me. I've got people who attack me, people who don't love the Lord, people who don't love the Word of God. But God, you've given me more wisdom than them. Not because of anything special in me, but Lord, because you've given me your commandments. And what does he say about it right there? He says, your commandments, your testimonies, they are ever with me. That's what it means to meditate on the truth. When the scripture, when you get it inside your heart and your mind and you meditate on it, then the word of God is always with you wherever you go. It gives us even more wisdom than those who fight against the word of God. And what else does he say there? He says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation." I went to the University of Tennessee, I went to Southeastern Seminary, I went to Southern Seminary. When I was at UT, I was in a very secular place. And there were brilliant people down there. But some of my professors, even in those days, were championing the merits of communism. My professor, my advisor, I was in the sociology department, he actually lived in a cave. That's not a joke. The man was brilliant. He was very ecologically minded and he, I guess, and his wife made the determination that they needed to live in a cave. I had brilliant teachers. But sometimes when you would listen to them talk, I would sit there and wonder to myself, 
does this man, does this woman actually believe that? I was, I was a 19 or 20 year old young man and they were telling us in these sociology classes all the merits of communism. And I was thinking to myself when they were talking about this, did you guys not catch that World War II happened? Did you all miss that? Because by the way, the Soviets, the Hitlers of the world, the Nazis, they were all communists. And you know what the chief tenet of communism is? There is no God. And so we need to give power and authority to a select few who can mead that out to everybody else. And what ends up happening is that the people on top become tyrants and the people on the bottom become prisoners. That's what happens. Brilliant people who are spouting this stuff off. I was not near as smart as they were. But in some things I had more wisdom. Not because I was smarter, but because I knew the Word of God. And you're the same way. If you know the Word of God, you can even be wiser than your instructors. And then the Scripture says here, the psalmist says, I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. You think about the ancients. You think about men like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. So many men, so much learning that has come before us. But as we've said, somebody can have all the knowledge that the world affords, but if they don't have the Word of God, they're foolish. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1, Psalm 53, verse 1, same verse, quoted in two different places. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. If somebody is bold enough to declare that there is no God, doesn't matter how many degrees they've got hanging on the wall, they are foolish according to the Lord. You know why? Because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. When you're in the Word of God, you grow in wisdom as the days go by more and more and more. Number three, you know you love the Scripture if you keep yourself from evil. You know you love the Word of God if you keep yourself from the paths of sin because look what he says there in 101. He says, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. You know, Jesus talked about ways or paths, did He not? He says, broad is the gate. Wide is that road that leads to destruction. And there are many that go in thereby. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to everlasting life. Was it Robert Frost who wrote that poem about two different paths and the road less traveled? You think about that. Most people do not travel the Christian road. You know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but a lot of people want to try and find some other way. The only way of satisfaction, the only way of life and peace is the Lord Jesus Christ. And somebody who is a student of the Word of God, who believes this book and wants to apply it to their life, is somebody who restrains themselves, who keeps themselves from the paths of sin. The Lord reminds me often, I bet He does you too, when Jesus in Luke chapter 9 was talking about the cost of discipleship. He said, if any man desires to come after me, the first thing you've got to do is deny yourself. And take up the cross and follow me daily. You think about that. If you want to follow Christ, the first thing you've got to do is say no to yourself. And let's be honest. That's the reason the majority of the people in this world do not say yes to God because that means they'd have to say no to themselves. But we prove our love for Scripture, church, when we're willing to say no to ourselves. So we can say yes to God and yes to being obedient to God. Number four, you know you love the Scripture if God is your teacher. You know you love the Word of God if God is your teacher. Verse 102, he says, I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. Let me ask you tonight, what is your knowledge of the Word of God? Now, if you feel like me, I feel like oftentimes when I'm preparing to preach 
or when I'm studying the Word of God devotionally or whatever, I'll see something, I'll read something, and I'll hear other people teach sometimes, and I'll think to myself, you know what? I've only scratched the surface of the truth contained in this book. There is so much truth to be found in the Word of God. But over the course of time, you've had people who've tried to teach you and instruct you in the Word of God. You've had pastors. You've had ministers. You've had Sunday school teachers. You've had parents. You've had friends and other people in your life who I'm sure have come alongside you and tried to mentor you and instruct you and teach you the Word of God. So I want you to hear me saying that God uses people to teach us the Scripture. My pastor for many years, well, in my home, first of all, I had my mom and dad who helped teach me the Word of God. At my church, I had a pastor who preached the Word of God. When I went to church, we had Sunday school teachers who taught me the Word of God. I'd go to maybe a choir program. I had choir teachers who were helping us to sing and to learn the truth of the Word of God. So I had lots of godly people who were pouring into my life and teaching me the Scripture. But here's what I want you to understand ultimately. When you and I are taught by the Word of God, when you and I are instructed in the Word of God, while God may use other human beings to help teach us, our real ultimate teacher is God Himself. You know, Jesus said to His disciples right before He died for their sins, in John 14 and John 16, He said, Men, it's good that I leave you now, because if I don't leave, I can't send the Helper to you. He said, but if I go, I'll send you the helper, the paraclete. I think it even says in some translations, paraclete, in the Greek language, it means one to come and call alongside you. When we say the, the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, He's the one who indwells us, and He constantly comes alongside of us and shows us how we can live for the glory of God. And what did Jesus say about the Holy Spirit in that same passage in John? He said, the Spirit will guide you into all truth. If we're confused about something, it's because perhaps all of us have not been led by the Holy Spirit in that matter yet. Because there is a truth that is contained in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us to that truth. I want you to understand that if you read this book, if you are a student of this book, if you're inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God, other people may help instruct you God may use other people in your life, but God is ultimately your teacher. He's the one who leads you in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. We ought to thank the Lord for that. Aren't you glad that God's our instructor? Isn't that, and, and by the way, some of the most godly people you've ever met, some of the most holy people you've ever met, may have only had a third grade education. May have only had an eighth grade education. You say, well, he or she dropped out of school when they were just in elementary school or when they were just in high school, they dropped out of school. You know, back in the day, some of you remember it had to be that way, right? If you had to help raise your siblings, if you worked on a farm, a lot of us had grandparents who didn't complete all the way through high school. But yet they were wise and they were holy because they were taught by God Himself. God will teach you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you'll seek Him, He'll teach you. Number five, you know you love the Scripture if God's Word leaves a sweet taste in your mouth. That's right, verse 103. You know you love the Scripture if God's Word leaves a sweet taste in your mouth. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste? Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now, I, I love sweet stuff. I'm great with sweet stuff. If I'm picking between salty and sweet, I'm probably going to go salty. So when somebody says, hey, you're a little salty, yeah, maybe. I've had a lot of it over the course of time. But now my wife, on the other hand, if she's picking between some tater chips or some ice cream, it's going to be ice cream. She likes the sweet stuff. Now let's do a little poll. How many of y'all are salty? How many of y'all are more salty? How many of y'all are more sweet? All right, we got more sweet people in here. That's good. It's good for us to, to be sweet. He says here, Lord, your word is sweet to my taste. It's sweeter than honey to my mouth. You think about it, you're on a hot day and you have some ice cream. Man, that sweet, cold tastes so good in your mouth, doesn't it? That's the way the word of God ought to taste to our soul. We're dry and we're parched and we're weary. 
And the Word of God is like sweetness to our mind, to our heart, and our soul. And man, there's a, when you go out here in the world, you know there's a lot of things that aren't so sweet. They're bitter. It's rough. We were just praying about that tonight. But we get alone with God and we read the Scripture. And man, just like taking a bite off a honeycomb, it's so sweet to us, the truth of the Word of God. It, this, this verse kind of reminds me of Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, verse 8. I'll never forget this passage of Scripture because this was kind of a passage of Scripture I was assigned in seminary to preach to a bunch of preachers in a sermon delivery class. When you send preachers to seminary, sometimes they just preach to one another. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. If you'll taste the Lord, if you'll try the Lord, then, then God say in Malachi chapter 3, try me now in this. Try me now in this. Be faithful in your tithes and offerings and try me now in this if I'll not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that you're not able to contain it. I'm just telling you there is a sweetness that comes with knowing God, serving the Lord, reading the Word of God. We're dry and we're parched and we're dusty and the Word of God is just like sweetness. To our soul. I don't know, I, maybe I'm, 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 I'm off here somewhere, but I bet you feel that way too, don't you? You've been hurting, you've been having a hard time, you get alone with God, and God starts to speak to you. I had a brother say to me the other day, he came to me, he was, I was counseling with him, he was kind of honest with me, he said, you know, I, I was going along, I was working, I was doing this and I was doing that, and I wasn't really getting alone with the Lord and getting in the Scripture like I needed to. He said, I was feeling convicted about that. He said, I'd been lazy or whatever. We get busy. He said, but I found out something. When I wasn't spending time with God, when I wasn't spending time in prayer and spending time in the Scripture, I bet you feel this way too, don't you? I feel this way. When we don't prioritize our time with God, we feel bad, don't we? We just feel bad. Things go bad. When we're not prioritizing our time with God. And that's, that's what this young man was telling me yesterday. He said, but you know what? I made a decision. I started going through my emails and there was one that came from this Christian group and he said, it's a daily devotion and he said, I hadn't been in the Word in a while. He said, I opened that up. I was having a terribly hard time. He said, I opened it up and that passage of Scripture was exactly what I needed to see. And what he's saying is, that was like sweetness to his soul. God ministered to him through that. I'm telling you, much more than anything, we ought to want to have an appetite for the Word of God. Sweetness. Number six, and finally, you know you love the Scripture if you despise every form of deception. Every form of deception. Verse 104, through your precepts I get understanding. Thank God. Therefore I hate every false way. Lord, through your word I come to understand what evil is, what falsehood is. And so, Lord, by virtue of the fact that you've instructed me and trained me and caused me to be like you, I hate every false way. There is so much deception down here on earth. So much deception. You know what's sad is that sometimes we as Christians get caught up in the deception. It's not only that we allow the devil to deceive us with his lies, which he does, by the way, because the Bible, Jesus said about the Pharisees and the Sadducees in John chapter 8, he said, you're led by your father... The devil, who is the father of lies, which by the way, if you ever want to see somebody just telling it like it is, read the Gospels. One time he called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. He said, you guys, you're deceived by your father, our adversary, the devil. So I'm not just talking tonight though about you and I being deceived by the devil. I'm talking about you and I sometimes getting caught up in the deception and being part of the deception. You know as well as I do that there are things that we can get involved in every day, transactions we can get involved in every day that are less than honest, less than transparent. I don't, I don't know if I need to say this. This might hurt somebody's feelings, but you know it's coming the time when we're supposed to be filing our taxes, right? 
He said, now preacher, I know what you're talking about, but the IRS doesn't count. Okay. The Bible says we ought to despise every form of deception, right? We can be deceived and we can deceive others. And the old saying is, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. As a man sows, so shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. If you sow deception, you'll reap it in time. We've got to be so careful. If we're lovers of the Word of God, let's live in the truth. Let's live in the light. So many people get taken advantage of by other people. Let's never be a part of that. Let's go above and beyond to be above reproach and to preserve our witness for Christ. Final thing I want to say to you. I ask you at the close of this message, can you honestly say, like this psalmist did at the beginning of our verses tonight, oh, how I love your law. Can you honestly say that to God? Lord, how I love your word. What metric, what gauge can we use to really determine how much we love the word of God? Well, probably how much time do you spend reading the scripture? How much time do you spend studying the scripture? How much time throughout your day do you spend meditating upon the Scripture? How much time do we spend maybe even memorizing the Scripture? How much time do we spend reminding ourselves of the truths of Scripture as we're going through adversity and hard times? And maybe most importantly, how much time do we spend applying the Scripture to our lives? What did Jesus say in John 14, verse 15 and 15, verse 14? He said, you are my friends if you do what I command. Being obedient to the Word of God. Here's what I've come to believe, and I bet you believe this too. We spend time on things we love. We spend time on things we love. I saw a man at a funeral not too long back. If I told you his name, you'd know him. Acquaintance, we always have a friendly time when we see one another. He pulled up at this funeral at a beautiful, fully restored, older car. I won't tell you what it is because I don't want you to go track him down. But he pulled up in this funeral at this beautiful, fully restored old car. I mean, beautiful. It had the navy color, it had the red interior, it was a convertible, it was beautiful. We went outside and I asked him about it. I said, is this yours? He said, yes, that's mine. I said, wow, that's amazing. He said, you know, my friend and I, we spent four years restoring this vehicle. You know why they spent four years restoring that vehicle? Because they loved it. They love the process. They love the finished product. And so they spent the time, right? If you and I love the Lord, if we love, if we truly love the Word of God, we will spend adequate time in this book daily, meditating on it throughout the day. 